welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I see my mic is unmuted. Yes, so this should be fine. Good morning for the second session of the eFlight Forum uh, 2022 in Kushan. Um, we probably have a very slight change in uh, our schedule as uh, we had a technical problem as David Solar from EASA has not joined yet. Um, so uh, in our first session this year, we're gonna talk about one very important enabler for the electric aviation taking place for especially eVTOL taking place. And this is certification and test areas and first uh, test presentations, test uh, demos uh, which have happened uh, over the last years. Uh, a lot of them in the last uh, two months, uh, there was a volocopter flying with a manned volocopter in preparation of the event in Paris and uh, where they're flying in Pontoise, uh, opening the first vertiport. And then there was um, another event happening in Kochstedt. Uh, most of you will not know this village. I actually didn't know it, uh, neither because the first time was at the air, uh, airfield. And this airfield is the very first uh, large test area which DLR opened this year. And in autumn, they had a demo uh, here, and I have the head of the test center, Daniel Zülberg from DLR, here with me. And yeah, I hope, uh, Daniel, maybe you, uh, we can unmute your microphone, uh, which I think should happen in a second. Yes. And then you are uh, welcome to share your screen, and do your presentation, and we hope by the time we can get also David in the line. Um, later in the session, after David, we also have um, Michael Hillemeyer from Volodrome, and he actually uh, will be probably also mentioned in your presentation as he was at this very first event with a Volodrome. Okay, Daniel, uh, if you could share your screen, the stage is yours. Yes, hello everyone. So let me try to get set up finally, hang on. Um... As soon as you can see something, I would be yes, happy it's for... Yes, it's not in presentation mode, but... Okay, the now it should be, right? Yes, now it's presentation mode. Yeah, okay, so cool. I mute my mic and... <clears throat> so yes, um, welcome everybody and thank you for the invitation. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about um, the ecosystem enabler role that we um, have as a test center in, in Germany and in Europe. Um, as you can see from the name, we are called the National Experimental Test Center, which is basically because we are nationally funded. So we are funded by our, our government, um, which does not mean that we are only open for national users or national campaigns, but we are open for worldwide uh, companies, worldwide research uh, endeavors and everything. Um, I was I focused a little bit because I knew that Michael Hillmeyer is also coming on the um, test center side. So I'm not going to dive too far into the demonstrations that were happening here because I think Michael is going to be touching on that. Um, I basically wanted to share with you because we only have 15 minutes, um, some, a little bit of an, an overview about our motivation and what we're actually doing uh, and why we're doing it. Um, and also in the end, touch a little bit about um, uh, something that I think is really important worldwide in terms of connecting um, the different test centers in form of a mutual network. But let me start. I think everybody is familiar with the basic challenges um, for the success of, of UAS or UAM technologies. Um, I think one thing that some uh, people, some companies, also some research institutions sometimes neglect is that we have an additional challenge that is not that widely spread in the aviation industry uh, in terms of its classical engineering skills, and that is scalability. So we can not base the new system 
on old parts of the system, but we have to develop a completely new system in terms of creating this throughput that everybody's talking about, right? Um, not diving into any of the other challenges. Um, just to give you a quick overview about DLR itself. So we basically address all those challenges, being the National Research Institution for Aerospace Technology. Um, but we do this spread out over um, more than 25 institutes at the moment. So they're not all listed on the, on the right side of the slide. Um, this is basically just to give you an overview on all the disciplines that, that we are touching with that. Um, and we do this in a rather decentralized way. So DLR is spread throughout Germany. Um, and we have certain hubs, for example, in Oberpfaffenhofen near Munich and in Braunschweig, which is right in the middle of Germany. You can see it on the map. Um, and also a little bit in Berlin and in Cologne, where we have, I, I would say, a focus technologies um, on UAS or that are able to being used to foster the ecosystem of UAS and um, DLR has, we, we basically have our own um, grant money that we can spend, but we are also heavily involved in European and German funded um, research projects, also with direct cooperations with all the different universities, different companies and everything, which is basically why DLR took this decentralized approach. So we are located at a lot of different universities, for example, and close to a lot of different companies that are important to us. Um, so if DLR is doing this and has been doing this for almost 25 years now, UAS research, what is the role of a test center? Because um, I think there's, there's different kinds you can do. We bought an airport, but what to do with it? Do you just open it up and everybody comes or do you put structure in it? So um, I think concerning those um, challenges, the first thing that came to our mind in terms of what should be done with the test center or rather what should its role be is we are not looking at the um, separate challenges within their respective disciplines, but we are taking a very, very connected approach um, and see that we as a test center deliver a platform with the according infrastructure so that we can unite those disciplines because there's a lot of people in the research um, branches, but also I think in the industry who are very focused, for example, on vehicle technologies. And um, they sometimes have problems with the airspace integration part. Um, notwithstanding, I think, the larger UAM uh, manufacturers, because they think about the entire ecosystem. But as, as soon as um, companies or the, the business cases start becoming a little bit smaller, we see that there's kind of a difference. Same thing from the other side. We have, um, for example, a lot of companies in Europe who are focusing on the airspace integration side. But on their side, they also lack at least um, a more detailed insight into how are the vehicles actually composed, what are the differences. And so we are trying to just create like a tiny micro ecosystem, which basically encompasses the entire world of challenges that we face. Right? Um, infrastructure in, in terms of uh, this platform thought means that we are building up centralized infrastructure, for example, data links, flight termination links, tracking equipment and everything that we operate, but we basically source it out to all the people who come to our test center to test. So people do not have to worry about certain kind of either rather costly or, or rather lengthy to acquire infrastructures because we are already supplying those. Um, on the other hand, I think um, a challenge that we saw, for example, in uh, London Gatwick in 2019 is drones do not really go with airports at the moment. So um, if you have an operational airport, as we do at DLR, um, this is basically a, a picture that nobody wants to see, right? Um, on the other hand, we have to get used to the, um, to the thought that this will happen. And so um, the basic approach that we took is just give us as many drones as possible and make researchers happy at the same time, which means we are a normal airport, but with a designated parallel UAS operation, meaning um, we do have an operational license, which means we could operate the airport 24 seven 
uh, basically uh, no mTOR limit. The only limit is the um, length of the runway. Um, on the other hand, our main focus is UAS testing and research. So um, from, from our point of view, we basically shifted the priorities as an airport operator because we are not focused on the commercial airport operations, but rather on creating a playground with as many opportunities as possible. So on the one hand, of course, we do gather the practical experience because we do operate the airport, but always um, with a sense of enabling new things and enabling research. And if push comes to shove, at least at our airport here, um, we will reject the commercial operation before we pause the um, research operation that's currently going on. Um, and I think one thing that is basically kind of going through and which is why I'm very happy for the invitation today as well, um, especially at test centers, we found that um, there's so many different projects, so many different use cases um, that it kind of creates a lot of, um, a lot of information, a lot of brain power is coming here. Um, and sometimes the, the people coming here themselves, they have challenges, but they don't know that somebody else already has the answer for those, right? Um, and so basically what we do um, in parallel to the actual operation of the airfield is we are trying to basically interconnect on the one hand, the, the regulatory bodies, um, research and the industry um, in, in terms of, not really consulting as a, as a service, but more in terms of networking, right? So we're trying to connect not only technologies, but also people. And I think those are the, the three main pillars under which we basically operate the test center. If you want to call it our mission statement, I think that will probably be fine. Um, one of the key enablers, I already touched on that, um, is we can enable high-risk tests in a simulated airport environment simulated means because the airport is ours we can basically simulate every kind of airport usage that we want so we can simulate a very very busy airport we can simulate a small regional airport and, and everything in between on the other hand because we have a very sparsely populated environment at least i have to admit speaking in german terms germany is quite crowded compared to other countries in the world um, and we also have this complete airport infrastructure. On the one hand, we have certain benefits from the airport that um, inherently increase the, the, the safety and decrease risks for testing because we have our own airspace and things like this, right? On the other hand, because it's so sparsely populated, um, the harm of different technologies that we test is going to be minimal. So something that we can do that probably no other airport in Germany would do is um, try to put a big jammer on the on the runway and have UAVs fly through that and see what happens. Right? Um, also, I think airport security in terms of cyber security um, in the interconnection between drones and airports, so how much can drones actually harm airports? is uh, one other aspect that um, can be um, researched over here. So this is basically why we decided to take the risk by our own airport, SDLR, um, and operate it and not just close it down for, for testing purposes because we have the most wide ranging portfolio of, of testing opportunities. And also in the long run, probably one of the biggest challenges in terms of air traffic integration um, will be at airports. So we also have this in, in terms of um, a research opportunity. Um, so what's currently been done already um, since we bought the airport in 2019, so we are still kind of in the build-up phase, although the testing has already started in 2020. Um, most of the th things that are happening right now, I think, which is based on the um, state of the technology is testing of individual UAS or their subsystems, right? Um, also, which is going to be more, but more in terms of demonstrations is the operation of multiple UAS within or with and beyond visual line of sight. Um, something that is starting to build up at the moment, which, for example, was one of the, the demo flights that have been happening uh, two weeks ago um, with the Volo drone um, and um, one of the German uh, rescue helicopter operators, for example, um, is collective flights of manned and unmanned aircraft and how do they interact. Um, 
We are also touching um, at uh, counter UAS technologies and putting a very strong focus on uh, fostering that topic during the next year in 2023. Um, and what we have a lot, uh, because I think within the ecosystem, those are some of the um, use cases that will gather a lot of acceptance as well. So they are more like the forerunners, what we call UAS special missions. Um, starting from um, medical deliveries, for example, to humanitarian aid missions. Um, and um, wh when there is like a natural catastrophe um, to collect data on where are people and everything and all the um, testing and a lot of the choreography in terms of recognition patterns and everything is also done here at the test center because um, the people then go out to live demos um, in the rural areas, for example, or um, with the International Red Cross in terms of humanitarian aid. Something that's um, starting to get gain traction um, is something that we didn't actually um, have as a viable business case for our own test center in the very beginning. I mean, that is using UAS as a validation platform. So for example, with the space-based technologies, um, before people mount them on satellites, um, they now have the um, opportunity and they are very keen on that to, to put the technology maybe in a pre-final design miniaturized version, but still to get some data on a very stable UAS platform. Um, and they're basically just researching their sensors, not, not the UAV itself, but also for that, you have to have like a reference environment. And this is something that we are creating here as well. Um, of course, because DLR itself, we are not only looking at UAV or UAM, um, we are looking at the entire aerospace ecosystem. So for example, in terms of new, um, new concepts for, for future airplanes, we do have uh, scale demonstrations going on as well. Uh, we are looking more and more at the impact of UAS technologies on the one hand in terms of health and society um, concerning people, but now also concerning the environment, for example, because we using a lot of air, or we are going to be using a lot of uh, the airspace that is now at least compared to, to other airspaces kind of uncrowded, uh, but this is the airspace where the birds live, for example. So we are looking at bird populations around the test center, for example, to see whether there is negative impact on that. Um, and since uh, we have an operational airport, DLR also operates a very large manned test fleet. Um, we do allow for manned flight testing as well. So not only in terms of if you have a UAM vehicle that is now piloted and it should be autonomous, but also if you have, as you can see there, um, a larger research aircraft, which is the A320 that DLR operates over there. Um, yes, and looking for time, um, I will quickly um, just mention this. I think one thing to be um, that, that is very important for the test centers um, to 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 work well is they need to be connected because. I think it doesn't work if everybody says, so I am the, I'm the best test center. And so everybody has to come to, to me um, and I will try to delay business for everybody else. But on, I think the, the enabling role of the test centers is to accelerate progress and not to halt it, which means that from, from our perspective, we are just now this year started to try to build a network in Germany. It's already quite advanced. I'm not going to into far detail. Um, in Europe, we are just starting to build this also, hopefully in cooperation with um, EASA. Um, also, the new drone strategy from the European Union also mentioned um, that they put a specific focus and action point on this kind of networks to, to have this acceleration effect, um, but also internationally, because I think it's very, very important for the industry, for the users to know which capabilities for testing are located where, and um, then utilize those capabilities and the according technologies by the industry, by small and medium enterprises and all the other stakeholders in the ecosystem. Um, so that's it from my side. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them now or later in the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, yes, now uh, we have 
uh, and we will discuss the questions because we already have some questions now, but we will discuss it together after the three presentations. And now I have the honor to announce David Solar, uh, who uh, is the head of uh, General Aviation and VTOL. So this is exactly uh, the EASA's uh, uh, directorate, which is concerning to all the things we are talking here. And uh, yes, David, uh, thank you very much being here. And sorry again for uh, announcing our uh, event here too late because we had the problem with the uh, getting all the permissions to run the event at the right time. But uh, I'll leave you the word. Uh, I, uh, maybe uh, I cut my mic, David, to please say something okay. to see if, if your mic is yes. working. Okay, is perfect. it working? It's working. Yes, so perfect. Then, uh, you can share a screen, you can do what you want. Yeah, we we'll do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, all, uh, first of all, a good uh, afternoon, I guess, on your side. Uh, it's a pleasure being with you. I will share my screen. Our windows. Yeah. Uh, do you yes, see, see something? Yes. It's yes. not in presentation mode yet. It's now in the uh, uh, organizer mode. Okay, uh, interesting. Uh, because I have no. Uh, uh, tuk -tuk 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 -tuk. Still a. Uh, it's still the uh, the not the presentation mode. And now? No, still. Ah, it's amazing. Display setting. Because I have only one uh, one screen, so I don't have enough. Uh, mm. So. Yeah, yeah. I think, David, you could try to uh, untick the box, use presenter view, because then you Hi, have the presenter default. view. Yeah. It's okay now? No. Yes or no? No, mm. no, it's no. still. Okay. Still <laughs> That's uh, funny stuff. You can untick the box, you say? Uh, use presenter view, because it, 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 go a little bit further right, where, where it says monitors. One more. Uh, yes. Yeah, and and then it will. And there is used presenter view. If you click off the used presenter view. Yeah. No, no change. No. And now. No, it still <laughs> sh still shows uh, the uh, not the. You could try also to press F five. Okay. Anyway, uh... I think uh, uh, we. Uh, is it a uh, full view uh, now? It's now. It's not full view, but uh, we 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 we. Interesting. No? Yeah. So I will. I, I will. Uh, let, we will not lose too much time. I will increase my screen over yes. there. Hi, David. Can you hear me? I think yes. you are sharing your uh, PPT screen. Your window. Yes. You are sharing your PPT window, not your whole screen. Maybe you can select your. Would you say you sharing your okay. screen, ah, and then yeah, we can I see no. that more. Yeah. Thanks. Something changed. Yeah, because uh, I will share the screen, the entire screen. So, yeah. But I cannot share. Ah, oh, yeah. Yes, share. No. Oh. Yes, here we go. It's perfect now. But uh, you, you mute it. Uh, can you unmute? No, he's still muted. It's okay. Um, unmute himself. Okay. Uh, David, could you please unmute yourself? I think somehow you're mute. Now you're. Now. Now it's. <laughs> now you're uh, unmuted, no, but the no, screen is gone. Uh, I will. I will try to share again. Yeah, but we can have the right share. screen, so we'll the... get there. You will get there. Yeah, share screen. Share. Mm -hmm. 
Now it should be okay. Yes, that's perfect. That's perfect. Good. I mute my mic. Finally. It's more complicated than the, to send the US in the air or, or any of it over. Um, so I will give you a, a short update of, of uh, IASA, um, US and eVTOL uh, um, programs and how, how we are running. So uh, we'll go directly. You know that uh, on the uh, US categories, uh, we have uh, three categories, the open uh, specific and certified categories. Basically the open uh, categories are, are under a CE marking where EASA actually is not involved. The specific uh, category, we have several um, uh, cat sales associated uh, looking at the SORA and, and we'll, we'll go to that. Um, and uh, there are uh, some uh, national authorities involved and also EASA may be involved in some uh, sale for and above. And we have the certified category, uh, which, which uh, basically we have published uh, uh, NPA for, for the operations. And uh, the, the NPA was published up to the uh, searches of uh, September this year, and we are currently reviewing the uh, almost 2,000 comments that we have uh, received. Um, on the two first categories, we, we have published already the, the associated regulations, mostly for, for operations. Um, we have also published a new uh, US uh, easy access rule, if you wish to access it. Uh, in September uh, this year, and uh, so that uh, it's gathering all the regulation in one place uh, to, to ease um, people uh, knowledge and, and how to comply. Uh, some of the changes, we, we postponed some transition dates. Uh, we uh, added some AMCs and guidance materials on, on geographic zones. Uh, we updated the operational authorization forms and, and um, we have uh, also added some uh, uh, new predefined risks uh, to uh, facilitate some of the uh, operations uh, of uh, inspection, surveillance of facilities and infrastructure where, where if you uh, comply directly with this predefined risk uh, hypothesis, you can uh, run your operation directly with your national authority in the uh, EU airspace. Uh, we are in parallel uh, developing the means of compliance of the special condition light US that we have published also uh, to enable uh, some uh, some of the um, uh, high risks uh, specific category uh, US. So we have uh, published the f uh, containment uh, means of compliance, uh, the, so, some of the uh, mitigation means uh, with, with regard to um, uh, the, the equipment systems, uh, mitigation into, in terms of frangibilities and, and stuff like that, uh, to uh, cope with some of the sale criteria or to reduce also uh, some of the sale level uh, within the, the SORA. Uh, all of that uh, uh, has been published and, and is available on our uh, website. Uh, we, in parallel, we are working with uh, Eurocae to develop other uh, means of compliance and, and the priorities uh, uh, have been set up, uh, especially uh, in subpart G, uh, crew interface and H well, with the C2 links where we reach a consensus within the uh, Eurocae uh, working group and, and uh, consultations internal is, is, uh, was ongoing and, and uh, should be published soon on, on the Eurogai uh, website. And in parallel, we had also uh, some research uh, activities uh, to enable further establishment of uh, means of compliance uh, within the drone uh, framework. And, and uh, this uh, Shepard uh, H2020 research project uh, was kicked off uh, early this year and we hope to have the results uh, by the end of uh, Oh, by mid next year, I think. We have also published uh, some uh, noise measure measurement guidelines uh, for specific category US, and it has been published for consultations. Uh, it's on a voluntary basis, but uh, it's uh, enabling uh, US uh, OEM or operators to have uh, predefined um, procedures to measure their noise. And, and that's something uh, that could uh, uh, enable a better uh, market access in, in some instances and also uh, compare the noise of some, some of the drones. So far, there is no noise limit, but uh, that's um, how we will uh, probably go with uh, measurements of uh, US 
uh, noise levels and, and we'll refine the procedure uh, as, as much as we uh, gather uh, additional experiences. We have also the SORA 2.5. So uh, we have been supporting the JARUSH Working Group 6 in finalizing the SORA. You, uh, you may know that there is a, a SORA 2.5 package, which is uh, uh, in, in the, the pipeline for public consultations. Basically, it's revising the body and some annexes. A new step nine approach in terms of containment and a quantitative approach to ground risk uh, as per Annex F of the SORA has been added. So uh, we intend to adopt this new package uh, as a means of compliance in 2023. And uh, that's something we are working closely in the frame of, of the uh, JARUSH working group. Now, uh, a big uh, part was also to enable operations uh, much wider than, than it was uh, today. And for that, we published the NPA 2206, uh, where really it, it addresses uh, all uh, aspects uh, linked to uh, UAS and, and urban air mobility, from initial air worthiness, container worthiness, the, the drone operation themselves, air operations, air crew, uh, ATM, U space, CERA, so the rules of the air, aerodromes, all of that have been a package in one regulations to enable uh, development of the drones and EVTOL uh, UM market. Uh, what uh, this NPA is, is first focusing on the uh, specific category, BVLOS operations and uh, manned uh, urban air mobility, so with a pilot on board. Uh, in uh, further steps, uh, we will tackle the, the US certified category uh, for uh, IFR cargo, so uh, quite large and uh, also uh, maybe, uh, and the dates needs to be refined, uh, certified category for UAM, urban air mobility, um, completely uh, autonomous, which is something that may not come as early as shown as, as in, in the slides, but a bit later on, but at least that's something we, we have in the pipeline. And the objective is to facilitate uh, so the, the operations in, in, uh, in green uh, that you can see on the screen. Uh, in parallel, we are uh, defining uh, use space and uh, we have issued a regulation on use space uh, to enable operations in, in uh, urban environments uh, with the associated conditions. We have published the regulations and now we are working, we have published a first set also of uh, guidance materials and we are working further to enabling uh, full use space usage uh, and you can see here what what we uh, intend as, as a use space which can be uh, quite a complex airspace mixing other airspace also uh, some geographic zones uh, that would be excluded and so on and we are working with service providers also uh, potential service provider to develop that it's a big part but it will be uh, one of the conditions and how uh, you know we will authorize also not only the UAS, but also all other airspace users and which, under which conditions uh, they could enter this kind of uh, airspace. Typically, uh, one of the conditions will be that they will be conspicuous so uh, that we can uh, see uh, uh, their position and rebroadcast re it within this airspace. That was on the US, on the EVTOL uh, side. Uh, we have published uh, back in uh, 2018 the special condition VTOL, uh, then the first set of means of compliance, the second set of means of compliance we hope to finalize uh, by next week or, or uh, early uh, next year the, the final publication. Uh, the MOC3 we have presented some uh, concepts uh, already and uh, on the MOC4 um, we are uh, now uh, working on that. Uh, to be uh, published this year uh, with a, a final publication is always difficult to, to put a date. It depends uh, heavily on the number of comments we are receiving. And this will be the final uh, phase of, of development under pure uh, IASA uh, leadership. After that, so basically um, that, that's where we are. Uh, MOC3, we have uh, defined them. Uh, we just need to gather and publish them. Now, uh, the MOC4, we have presented at the uh, Rotorcraft uh, um, uh, VITO and uh, VITOL Symposium, uh, which was organized also in the frame of European Rotors. Uh, the MOC4, and I will touch based on that, uh, topics. 
which are uh, the one I, that could be here, uh, all definitions, mass, center of gravity, climate information, vibration, structural design loads. Uh, at least we have published already some stuff, but to uh, clarify uh, some uh, loading conditions, especially for V-tail considerations or other unusual designs, emergency conditions, uh, lift thrust system installation, especially with electromagnetic fields. Um, all uh, also on uh, non-rechargeable batteries, uh, isolations of fluid and vapor, uh, pressurized system elements, because some of them wants to be uh, pressurized, equipment and system, flight manual, electronic checklist, and, and the like. And in parallel, uh, we have also issued in 2022 the prototype technical design specification for VertiPort. Uh, that's really uh, enabling uh, a design of a VertiPort at least the uh, FATO area, not, not uh, obviously the passenger ones, but uh, starting to define all the conditions and uh, requirements associated to that, which was quite uh, welcomed by, by industry and uh, can uh, already identify some uh, potential uh, areas uh, eligible. And uh, we are also working heavily with Eurocae uh, and the working group uh, 112 dedicated to EVTOL. And uh, in 2022, four uh, standards were published, four in 2021, one in 2020. Uh, consulted six, and so should be published uh, soon in 2023 also. And uh, plan in 2023 as consultation, we have 10 standards and, and 2024, uh, two. Uh, and it will quite be a comprehensive set of, of uh, requirements and, and means of compliance at the end of uh, 2024. Uh, in parallel, obviously, we are working uh, with uh, each uh, manufacturer on, on specific means of compliance with their specific designs uh, to uh, enable uh, first uh, type certificate and hopefully uh, first operations uh, in 2024 uh, in the frame of the uh, Olympic Games, uh, Paris Olympic Games. And, and that's it for me. Would be a pleasure uh, to Thank you very much, David. have your questions. And, uh, so that's really great. And uh, I think you finished exactly uh, as perfect as a, a lead over to Volocopter, because when you talk about flying at Paris, um, <laughs> we now have uh, Michael, uh, Michael Hillermeyer, who is the head of strategy and head of Volo Drone. Uh, and uh, yeah, as we're a little bit behind schedule, I leave the parole for you uh, and you introduce yourself and the company uh, and uh, what you're planning because I was very impressed. I had uh, uh, just in the last two months in Pontoise, there was the first flying of the Volocopter at the first Vertiport opened there. And then you were flying with a drone where we also met in Kochstedt. So uh, all the speakers here, uh, it's joining all together with very latest events. Okay, I maybe you share your screen, great. And I think your mic is on, so I turn my video off. Good, so you can hear me well, uh, just yes, a quick we, check. Great. Yeah, uh, so, and great, and you see my slides. I see it on the on Perfect. the screen. So, yeah. good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Hillermeyer. As Willy said, um, I'm leading the strategy and also the Volo Drone uh, topic here at Volocopter. Very great to be here today. Uh, in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I will give you some insights on what Volocopter is about, what we are creating, and what the next steps are, and who we are working to. And um, first of all. I would like to start with a video. Um, so I quickly have to check if the uh, sound is working in a second. Uh, so let me check if that works. So actually, I okay, the video is not, give me one second. Um, uh, just, just one reminder, if you reshare the screen, maybe uh, you click the button at the, to, at the bottom uh, where it says share sound. Because that's what yeah. we did yesterday. Okay. Yeah, I, I did that, but I think it was a. Yeah, I will check. Give me one second. Okay. So. It's on the screen now. But and then let's try again. Seems that there, yes, it is playing. 
I don't have sound at the moment. It's coming. It's hopefully loading. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Uh -oh. Sound so bad. So let's start. What is Volocopter about? Uh, so I think all of you are aware of uh, Volocopter is creating a new ecosystem for urban air mobility to provide also then sustainable and convenient air mobility uh, for everyone. Uh, so you see here, for example, our flight in Singapore, which was the, of course, very uh, unique uh, milestone also flying in the city uh, with all approvals here in Singapore. But of course, um, we want to bring it also to different locations worldwide. Uh, so for example, we have here, how can you imagine a, an urban air mobility flight and so-called air taxi flight, right? So flying from an airport to city center or to other locations within a, within a city network, which we then call, of course, urban air mobility. And it's not about only the vehicle itself, of course. It's also about the whole business model from being an OAM, but also provide then services for our customers, which we call then urban air mobility as a service. That means Volocopter provides a family of aircrafts. You have seen also in the videos, all aircrafts are flying. We are all testing them regularly. We are doing, of course, different steps in certification as also David um, mentioned in his presentations, a different kind of uh, family of aircraft. And then of course, we are also looking at our operating platform, the so-called Volo IQ, where we want to integrate and then also in the end uh, have the customer interfaces in, in, one, in one bucket. How do we look at the urban air mobility in a bit more detailed? Uh, so you see here our family of aircraft and you see some cities worldwide with different uh, kind of ranges. Um, and our ambition is to provide a full stack approach. That means not only end with a certification, but also start then also some kind of air carrier and airline business that is all integrated as i said in the volo iq and uh, this is integrating our vehicle management uh, the flight operations but also the customer front end and also ground operations this volo iq platform gives us of course um, the, the, the possibility to share also insights with regulators but also with cities worldwide and we started very early to start with a very partner-oriented approach, right? So Volocopter want to create the ecosystem. And this ecosystem exists not only of Volocopter, but of many more partners. Uh, for example, in, in Paris, we are working with different partners from ground infrastructure um, and also, of course, um, the integration into the airspace and uh, many more partners uh, in, in the ecosystem. When we look further, um, you have seen it in the video, and that I think is very, uh, very unique for us. Um, and we are very proud of that. We have flight, uh, flown um, manned and unmanned uh, around the globe. We are testing right now also uh, heavily this year in Paris in the Corus XUM project. We tested uh, also the other aircrafts, uh, as mentioned, 
um, in the other presentation, uh, also in Kochstedt at DLR airport, where we also were part of the a deconfliction flight in Germany with a Volo drone. So you see, it's all about testing, flying, iterating, and then also, of course, working towards a clear path to certification uh, with EASA, and then, of course, uh, in, in subsequent uh, years also with other regulators around the world. Quickly, I want to, of course, give you also a quick introduction to our family of aircrafts. I think we are all very interested and very um, technology focused here in this round so of course it's all about uh, also the aircraft um, so the Volo City, as also described by David is uh, our vehicle which we are progressing and bringing into type certification with the ASA we are um, having a two-seat aircraft fully electric 18 rotors and then also complying to the highest safety standards and lowest noise also described by EASA so this is the aircraft uh, you also saw in the video, which we want to bring into service within the next two years, and we want to fly as, as soon as uh, in 2024. And uh, this is what we are testing heavily right now, right? Uh, we are doing also, of course, um, a lot of uh, component ground testing, but of course, a lot of test flights as well. And um, this is our vehicle to bring urban air mobility to life in the next years. Of course, we are also looking into the future and you see also here a real picture out of Munich um, where we are testing also our Volo region, um, the next generation, um, which is extending our reach. You see here four seats, more range, but of course we don't have any compromise on safety levels. This is what we are testing. We are flying regularly also this aircraft. And then of course, what I'm looking also after here at Volocopter is the Volo drone program. That means cargo units. Uh, also, you see here, DB Schenker is invested in us, focusing also on how do we move goods in urban mobility environment. And uh, for example, on this picture, you see the, the demonstration we did in, in Hamburg flying. And also, of course, this year um, in, in Kochstedt. So we are using technology um, in a way that we can uh, apply it for different use cases and also open up different market. Um, and what is what does that mean for our Volo IQ? Our Volo IQ, as I said, is the platform to integrate all of the different aspects in an urban environment. And this is also integrated from all of our products. That means all of our products have the interfaces and also the connections to make Volo IQ a very powerful platform in the back end. We are also working with very strong partners like Microsoft, for example, on that. And this will be integrated step by step also over the next years. You see here um, an example where you have different word reports. They have different data points. Of course, you have vehicles in operations. You have airspace topics. You have also, of course, some data topics. So that will be all shared and integrated then in that digital platform. What does that mean for our next steps and the roadmap to our first commercial use cases, as it was also stated in the in the agenda for today? We are very very uh, closely working, of course, on the certification pass. Why? Because for us, and we see that also for the whole industry, of course, certification is key to success. That was the reason why we also very early designed our aircraft and brought our aircraft very early into the discussion with regulators around the world. Of course, preliminary uh, EASA, and uh, then also took the steps in order to comply with all uh, requirements in order to get first to market. And uh, I think we are a clear on a clear strategy and a clear path to be first to market. Um, and this is our next step. So as I said, and also you saw it in the video, we want to um, work on the type certification as closely um, as possible over the next uh, 12 to 18 months, right? Um, and then also uh, we are working on uh, the other parts of the ecosystem, as I described. So already today, we are the, we have a design organization approval already received in 2019. Um, we have uh, the approval of the certification plan. We have uh, taken over a production organization, which we are currently also working with a German authority to extend our production organization. Um, we are working on the compliance verification. And then also, of course, we are working on the air operator certificate AOC. Um, to also provide then services as an operator. 
And of course, once we have hit um, the EASA TC milestone, um, EASA and the global community of regulators, let's say, are working also, of course, with us on a global validation of TCs. Uh, so also preliminary, I think, one of the highlights of the last years, of course, with Singapore and many other regulators around the world. And of course, this is our first step into the market. Um, and that's also, I think, for us, the huge milestone we are looking for, what also to then celebrate with you. Um, what does it mean now for all of us? I think it's closer than most of us um, will see it or think, right? Uh, so we are really happy with the progress. Um, we, we, of course, have to do our homeworks. Uh, that's clear. Work on certification aspects, work on the ecosystem, but also with our partner in Paris, for example, uh, I think we see very good traction and progress. So that means for us, uh, order your seats, take, take a look at our booking system, for example, at our um, also infrastructure and operations system, which we will test. Um, and then we take a flight and we fly with the first air taxi um, fully certified very soon. Thank you very much. That's it from my side. Um, and then I hand over back to Billy. Thank you very much. And I would also ask Daniel to get back on the screen uh, as we now are going to uh, have still some time for questions. So perfect. Um, also, just want to remind the audience, especially in China, we have uh, the option that you can ask also questions and they will be transferred here and we can ask them. I have a lot of questions, so I will start uh, immediately. Um, which is to uh, Michael and to David. Um, the plan is fly in Paris. Do you think your the Volo copter will be in time with a certification? I know nobody knows it, but uh, you will be in time for a certification to have the certification to fly in Paris. David first, then Michael. Uh, yeah, we, nobody can pre, can can uh, you know forecast the future, but uh, we are working uh, very closely with with Volocopter, and we we've got all these goals uh, in mind and, and and as a target. So uh, we will do our utmost best to to reach these milestones. But after you know, uh, still some flight testing will go on and stuff like that. We can have plenty of uh, of mm -hmm. hiccups, but uh, the plan is in Paris 2024 right now. Okay. And uh, uh, just quick add-on question, would it be possible that, for example, nearly everything is ready to fly there with a permit to fly instead of a full certification, or would a service like this not be possible with a permit to fly? A permit to fly is still an option uh, that is uh, okay. indeed uh, possible, for sure, uh, but, but we really aim to have the full type certificate. Okay, and Michael, on the same subject? I think nothing major to add uh, to, to David. I think we have the, of course, same opinion. We have to do our homeworks, of course, as also uh, we, we see, uh, of course, some challenges, but uh, I think we are very confident that uh, we can do it. And uh, that's the goal. And uh, as David said, uh, nothing to add from my side. Okay, I have a question to Daniel. Uh, on the test area, because I think at the beginning, at least and on my side, there was a little bit confusion that uh, it's called officially UAS, so Unmanned Air System System. But maybe you can clarify for that who can fly there, that it's, I, I think it's not only UAS, and I think you made it already clear, but I think this is one issue we always get question on. Yeah, I think <clears throat> um, in, in terms of the, the, the political uh, message um, that was basically the namesake, right? Because we want to foster um, UAS and UAM technologies. But because I think even since 2018, when we pitched the idea, um, the ecosystem has evolved. So I think now we should add, we should probably say advanced air mobility, which includes mm -hmm. everything from from piloted to non-piloted, from eVTOL to STOL to anything. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, we, we do not uh, discourage <laughs> any any form of testing. Yeah. Okay. Um, a question to Michael. 
uh, we were seeing uh, before you showed this image of the Volo uh, uh, Radio, Volo Radio. I think you re renamed the Volo Connect to Volo Radio, uh, flying in. I think it's over Schleisheim. Is this a full scale or a scaled uh, aircraft flying there? We are testing different kind of aircraft. Um, so what you saw in the picture is uh, is almost full scale. Yes. Uh, so we are uh, they are very progressed as well and also very happy. Um, but of course we are testing different kind of aircrafts in different locations. Uh, and I think Daniel said it. Kostet is a quite interesting, of course, uh, location for Germany, but Europe and I think also globally, where we can test, of course also many more aspects and also daniel you talked about the runway right and uh, the the remote uh, area location uh, let's say so this is quite good and interesting also for us um, also with uh, different kind of aircrafts yes okay uh there's a, a question for uh, david solar uh what, what what's your perspective of uh, perhaps having a unified global a certificate a global framework or standard for e vehicle certification such as uh, like the existing uh, part 23 or part 25 around the world or is there such an effort um, underway right now so uh, yes uh, so far uh, there are uh, different approaches uh, around the globe so we we hope to really uh, uh, come to a, a unified uh, solution at the end of the day um and and uh we, we are working uh, now uh, uh, very heavily with with the fa uh, uh on on trying to converge on the main uh issues uh, so far the main divergence i would say um and and uh i think the, the commenting of the uh issue paper g1 from joby is a very good opportunity on that um so uh, that that's really uh, we we have now at least agreements that uh, we we want to converge uh we hope that other uh, and it's also extended to uh, ANAC TCCA and and uh, hopefully uh, CAC is, is joining uh there is definitely uh, a need to converge it's a global market aviation so we need to have it uh, a global scale um, and and obviously uh, you know uh, there are some uh, some uh, uh, things that we need to clarify. Um, we do think in Europe that it's not a general aviation type of operations. You know, air taxi over Paris or uh, or Singapore or or Beijing will definitely not be uh, you know uh, flying a Cessna 172 uh, over the countryside and a couple hours uh, a month. Uh, but here we are speaking more of uh, 20 hours uh, usage of, of uh, this kind of uh, vehicle uh, on everyday uh, basis. So, uh, so that that's this convergence we need to ensure, um, and and hopefully we get there uh, partially in 2023 on the main issues and 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 more globally afterwards. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, David. Um, so here is a quick follow-up que um, question. Uh, what do you have any comments on the FAS recent powered lift category? A possible. Uh, certification framework for EV2, and do you think um, EASA would ever consider converge on this uh, aspect? So we, we have two things. Huh? We have uh, first uh, uh, on the uh, certification side, I think here we need to be global, that's for sure. And after on the operational side, and operational side, we are already very different. So uh, the FA has chosen to, uh, to go to the powered lift, which is was set up more for tilt rotor at the very beginning. Uh, we have still uh, tilt rotor uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, rule making tasks because we have uh, one, one project actually on, on tilt rotors. Uh, but we have moved to, towards a framework which is much wider than that and which the, is the one I, I presented in the NPA 2206, um, enabling and, and forward looking, more forward looking. So we'll see on the operational side, I think, you know. Uh, we may have some differences. First, the, the landscape is completely different. We we don't have the part 135 in Europe, for instance, like in the US. Uh, so it, it's very much uh, different and will not harm the industry. What will harm the industry is on, on the machine side uh, and, and the equipage. That, that's where we need to uh, really converge to make it flying uh, around the globe. Okay, thank you. 
Um, I have uh, uh, another question on uh, Daniel because I think you uh, you told us that the, uh, or no at the event in uh, Kochstedt at the last event there was uh, uh, shown that in some of the tries you even trying to build up a small city there sometimes scales sometimes in real scale for simulating like how to fly between buildings and stuff like this will this continue and will you really build up a let's say uh, a, a safe environment uh, for for testing there also for inner city operation or will it be that after the operations has been done there roughly that then Will, you will go to uh, centers where you're going to test. I think you're muted. Uh, it, it shows Sorry, unmuted. Yeah, I'm, I'm um, muted on the, on the, on the, <laughs> on cooking the itself there. Yeah, so, yeah. sorry. Um, yeah. So, so the plan is actually to, to have a two step approach, um, mainly cost driven. So the, the first thing that we are looking to to do is really um, have a, a scaled urban environment which means we have we will have full scale roads but with downscale buildings um, on a scale of one to four so um, this means that we will have it, it's supposed to be like a modular container city so we won't build proper housing which is too expensive i think and you can't change the layout of the city easily um, but um, on an area i think of around um, a thousand square meters or maybe even more we will have this like model city and as one um, and we will have different kinds of like vertiports elevated ones uh, some some on the ground and everything and just be able to move things around um, but also um, for example some of the containers are designed to be um, I, I would say physically accurate in terms of um, noise propagation. So we can change the, the facades of the buildings and do noise measurements within. Um, and we basically reserve the opportunity to build a smaller full scale um, part as well, which we are not planning or not planning yet because I don't know if it's actually necessary to have like a, a, a full scale vertiport building, for example, but if need be, and then we will have to look for additional funding, I think. Um, we, we are actually planning on, on um, facilitating those kind of tests, yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I have, uh, I think probably we can look at the time and last question uh, to Volocopter. Um, I no, because probably it will be the first chance for any outside people to get a ride on an EV toll. So will you sell tickets for the Paris event or will it be only VP people flying on it? And if there are any other event worldwide where I could say, okay, I have the money, I want to fly an EV toll, where can I do it? And I think probably Volocopter is one of the first companies which want to get commercially in service. So uh, where do you think uh, this could be happen and when do you think it could be happen? Yeah, good question. I think uh, we will of course communicate more about our Paris launch than uh, very early. Uh, so stay tuned for your question around the tickets for, for Paris and flying and so on. So of course we have to do first our homeworks and do the testing. And then once that is secured and we have a clear uh, go to then uh, we are ready also for that deployment i think around the world of course you were asking for that we will start with uh, paris as, as described then of course we are working closely with singapore rome and uh, other cities and uh, i don't know your travel schedule but i think you will find some slots uh, and also some easy access to tickets then over time um, of course it will be uh, um, in the beginning, I think more difficult because also of supply and uh, our homeworks we have to do, right? But uh, then uh, I think over the next years, there will be a chance to uh, for everyone in this crowd, I think, to fly hopefully with us and uh, then also enjoy the view from above and also enjoy the benefits of urban air mobility uh, around the globe. Okay. Uh, I think I think uh, we are done here with our session. Uh, uh, thank you very much.
for joining. Excuse again that we were very late informing you, but even better shows how reactive the scene is that we get you got you together a first class panel on EV tolls and uh, on the future developing this uh, just a microsystem, the ecosystem of it. Um, if anybody of you has a question to one of the others, uh, we still have about two minutes time. If not, then I say thank you very much and uh, hope to see you uh, next time, maybe at Aero, Friedrichshafen. We will have several panels again, and if not, at any event around the world. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. How can you get an e-flight tunnel? Just scan the QR code on this page. Or just type in your browser www.eflightjournal.com then you receive the page with the latest online news on electric flying, EV tolls and everything which is connected with electric mobility in the air or you can click the link on the top and then you go to the latest PDF version, which you either can read in the Yumpu reader directly on your screen, like a conventional magazine, or you can go and download the magazine as PDF file so that you can read it offline wherever you want. Thanks for watching and goodbye.